Shelly, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Fantastic. Doing well. Great to see you. You too. You too. Always a pleasure. I feel like every time I see you, I, um, I come away with a little bit more energy than I walked in. And uh, you're a great resource for, uh, for my customers, but also for me. So I appreciate this opportunity. Thanks for taking the time to meet with us. Absolutely. You know, uh, I have to say that I reciprocate what you just said. I feel the same way. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, so I know you are not a coffee drinker like I am, but, uh, but I do, um, I think you drink tea, right? You're a tea drinker. I am an herbal tea drinker. Mm. Try to stay, try to stay away from the caffeine if I can. I hear you. So it's non-caffeinated tea. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do you take it just neat, I guess, or do you mix in some cream? What do you do there? Well, I drink a product called Ticino, which is, it's kind of like a fake coffee. So all the coffee drinkers out there are probably going to roll their eyes. <laughs> it's made, it's, it's a brown tea that's made out of dandelion root and chicory root and almonds and hazelnut. And so it's dark like coffee. And so I love it with almond milk, coconut milk. I might throw in some oat milk and I love it with cinnamon. It, it's kind of like drinking dessert in the morning. It's delicious. That is that sound that does sound nice. My favorite coffee drink recently has been an oat milk latte with honey and cinnamon, and I can't stop drinking it. It's like I, uh, I, I drank two in one day one time. I just couldn't stop myself. I was like, I'm gonna get another one. <laughs> I didn't get much sleep that night, but it was great. It's really great. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. So, uh, when was your first cup of tea or? Um, did you used to drink coffee? No, I was, my, my, my caffeine, um, I guess, crutch was not coffee. It never has been. I used to drink it if it was available, but really I was kind of a diet Coke addict. That was my coffee. Gotcha. gotcha. And that, that kept me awake. <laughs> It'll do that. It'll but do then, that. you know, as caffeine does, you have a crash afterwards. So sure. Uh, but never really drink coffee. Yeah, this kind of came about because we, um, well, we started giving out these cups to our, our customers and, um, and everybody loved them so much. They're great little cups. And we, um, I'm a, I like coffee. I, I didn't used to drink it until, um, until later uh, and, and actually probably early 20s. Uh, early mid twenties. And then, um, and I would always fill it with sugar and cream. And, um, and I got so tired of asking people to put in, they would say, Hey, can I get you a cup of coffee? And then I have to tell them what I want. And I was like, Nope, that's not going to work anymore. I just wanted black. So I sort of forced myself to like black coffee and I actually ended up liking it better. And I, I love black coffee. I do have the occasional latte. And then, like I said earlier, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, I just, just got used to it and it's great. Um, but so tell me about Maxis and it's, and, and tell me about your company. Tell me about your role there. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so everybody can under, know you a little bit like I do. Well, sure. Thank you. So I am in business development with Maxis Advisors. Um, we are a site selection and discretionary incentives firm headquartered in Charlotte. Um, we have been helping companies really secure incentives, or I like to refer to them as financial benefits. They're cash or, or light cash. Um, think of tax credits, but not necessarily tax credits, um, like property tax abatements and cash grants and um, support from state and local governments to help them offset the cost of growth, essentially, if they're expanding or relocating. Uh, most companies, especially manufacturers, are having to invest routinely year over year in machinery and equipment to improve efficiencies or improve automation, et cetera. And they don't realize uh, many times that these types of incentives are available to them. And so that's really what we're here for is to provide education, insight, support, um, and um, basically a representative for that company to have those conversations with economic development officials across the country. So the companies that you're, so if I could kind of recap, the customers, companies you work with are growing in some way. They're either moving or expanding or, and they're looking to make some type of a capital expenditure to, to, to enable that growth. 
And now I've, I hear companies all the time say that they are getting something from their local government, something from the county for that growth in terms of because they're going to add so many employees. Um, but you're saying that if I'm correct, and I, and I think this because I'm thinking about some of the people we work with with you, it's that they they might be missing out on some other opportunities that exist beyond just what most people know about. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, it's that can be really common. You know, there are really three three different buckets of incentives or tax credits. There are the statutory tax credits that are available uh, to a company as a matter of the tax code or the law. If you make this investment or if you add these jobs, you are going to automatically qualify for, let's say, a jobs tax credit. And then there are those that are um, really not known about or they're not real obvious or they're not advertised that can be available when conversations are had with officials to really help them understand more details. And legislation is changing, as we all know, we've seen a ton of it change um, through what's happened with this pandemic, um, even looking at the recent uh, American Rescue Plan. But just a business's ability and bandwidth to keep up with the legislative changes at the state level across the country and also the county community levels can be kind of foreboding, especially when they're working on juggling, trying to grow a business, manage the business, et cetera. So yes, uh, many times these incentives are in addition to what a company may have already secured on their own. Um, just because, you know, you we've got former economic development officials on our team. And so they used to be the individuals that companies would speak to. And so we just kind of know the landscape. We understand how to navigate it, how to have the conversations and how to create a stronger bond between the business and the community and really create that relationship so that it's a collaboration and get creative with how the community can support the business above and beyond what they may already be doing. That's great. That's great. I, I did not realize negotiation would have, you know, could play such a role. I kind of thought it was kind of black and white, but you know, thinking about my, even when I do my taxes, it's like, there's a, it's not always black and white. It's not like you just, you know, you have to know how to, have to know the system. So, um, so what's your company's favorite word? Favorite word. Oh, our company has lots of favorite words and uh, core values that we really strive to to accomplish, not just with our clients, um, but with the communities and with each other and everyone that we really speak with. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll have to pick kind of my favorite, um, and that is basically doing what you say you're going to do, keeping your word, trust, credibility. Um, we're really, really focused on driving value with not only our character and our trust and the way we work with individual clients, but also with um, communities and state officials. And that's honestly why we're called Maxis Advisors. The goal is to maximize the good and the benefit and the value for all parties. That's good. Well, I can definitely vouch when you tell me you're going to do something, you've always done it and you're right on it. And, uh, and I appreciate that. You've uh, you definitely have that credibility with me. That's for sure. So um, you talked about maximizing our, your customers. It sounds like that sounds, sounds like it's a great lead into my next question, which is what does a great day look like at Maxis? A great day. A great day um, at Maxis would be a day when, uh, I don't know, one of our most recent examples, uh, just overcoming a challenge, a big challenge. We, we've got a project, we've got a client, and they kind of want to fit a square peg in a round hole. And our team is really, really creative. And, and one of our project managers, Andy Brownell, quite frankly, is just a genius in making stuff happen. But in this case, we had a client who needed to lease a facility and they were adding their facility they're headquartered in New York currently. It's a German-owned company. 
they needed to lease a facility and they had some very specific criteria, lots of really, really heavy machinery. The floors had to be a certain depth and strength and they had to have a channel in the floors, et cetera. Well, we did the site selection for them and we, we looked all over and we narrowed it down to three locations and their, their dream building that they needed was not for lease. And the other two would have done, they would have worked, but it would have cost uh, significantly more money. The incentives weren't as good in those areas. And so the team was able to work with some of our contracting partners and we found a partner to purchase the building for our client and lease it back and also handle all of the upgrades that were necessary inside that building. And we did it within dollars of the client's budget. And so we were all pretty much cheering uh, when we were able to accomplish that. So sometimes you have those situations that just seem almost impossible, um, but we are optimists and we are going to do everything we can for a win. Yeah, I have no idea what that's like. I've never had a customer ask me for the impossible. You know, <laughs> now all my customers are just nice and they fit and it's nice little, no, I'm just kidding. It's uh, I know what you mean. That's a, that's a great day when, um, when you can get through that. It's awesome. And that sounds like, uh, that's the kind of customer that's going to come back to you. And, um, and, uh, we, that's great. Wonderful. Um, so you work with manufacturers of all different types. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what you've seen in the industry, the manufacturing industry as a whole. You cover, well, actually, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the industries you cover? I mean, it sounds like it's sure. fairly, fairly broad, but also the territories you cover in terms of geographic, that type of stuff. Sure. So we'll, we'll start with industry. So what, when we're talking site selection, it's 100% industry agnostic. And, and so I'll kind of start with the site selection piece. The site selection is critical um, for, for many different reasons, regardless of industry. But I'd say one of the biggest challenges with every business right now, and I think everyone listening to this and you're aware of this would be labor. Um, you know, we can go and find the most beautiful site, the perfect site, logistically location, uh, you know, distance from where they need to be for a port. Um, the size of the building, the land can be perfect. But if you don't have the labor available, it doesn't matter. And so, you know, that's just kind of one component, which is industry agnostic. And then I would say on the incentive side of the house and just kind of um, from a holistic perspective, I would say manufacturers are, I'd say they make up about 75% of who we represent as it relates to both site selection and incentives. Uh, we also work with data centers, distribution centers, healthcare, um, just about really any industry with the exception of, let's say, um, I don't know, a retail restaurant or a pizza shop that's looking for incentives. Um, those are scenarios that are unlikely to be good projects for incentive negotiation. And the main reason for that is their location is driven by market demand. It's, it's not driven by um, a partnership necessarily with a community. Now, sometimes they can be if they're part of a development, but in general, a retail location is probably not the best. Um, headquarters would be perfect for both site selection and incentives. So I didn't think about this in, until... Uh... How much of a role does the labor in a community play in your site selection? So if, I, if I'm trying to put a, uh, say, an upholster furniture manufacturing facility into a community, do you actually go so far as to look at the labor pool within that area and their typical education or, you know, qualifications or like, does that factor into site selection? Huge. Oh, I didn't think it's, it's so important now when I'm having conversations with clients, I lead with talking about their labor needs um, because it can be critical. I'm working with a company right now um, that is a manufacturer headquartered in California that is looking to grow to 22 new locations in the next year and a half. And they're currently working on incentives on their own. And one of my biggest questions was, how are you analyzing the labor availability? 
um, it's it's critical. It's it's looking at what is to what is available today with the SOC codes that you're going to need. Who is your competition for that labor? What is it going to look like three years, five years, ten years? What are the growth trends in that market? So your competition for labor might be these five companies today, but what is it going to look like in five years? And so we do a very deep dive into A, what your needs are, short-term and long-term. And we provide a very, very deep assessment with each of the sites that we're looking at. That's great. That's great. It's, That's it's, it's really important. It's and it's, it's the question, we, we do this across the country. That's great. The, um, if you think about it from a manufacturing standpoint or from, I mean, just, you could actually think about it in terms of your own. Um, well, I guess you've kind of gone a lot into, to, to Max's talk about, I don't know how, I don't, to be honest, I don't know that many other site selection companies, but what do you think separates Max's from other, I guess one way to think about it is what separates Max's from doing it yourself? from a company that can just say, we could do it ourselves um, versus also Maxis versus other advisors that might be out there? Sure. Well, and I think the answer to that, uh, to doing it yourself um, really is going to going to depend on a lot of different things. Um, what sorts of internal resources do you have available to you? Um, one of my clients that I'm working with now is their vice president of construction. And so internally, they've been looking for these sites and he's reached out to me and said, Shelly, this is great. We've got all these sites, but the labor piece is huge. I can't look at all of this while also trying to manage um, everything else that I've got to do in my role. And so sure. there's a bandwidth question, there's a knowledge question, there's an understanding of combining the site selection with not only the labor, but what do the incentives look like in that area? Um, I'm working with another company who's in agricultural technology and they're doing some expansions all over the country. And we're actually working with their real estate agent who's pulling the locations for us. And then we are providing the assessment on which ones are best for incentives, because in their case, they can make a decision based on incentives. Um, but typically we don't ever want to choose a location just based on incentives. It's really the site first incentives come second. So it's bandwidth, it's knowledge, it's what kind of insights and information do you have at your fingertips to provide this information quickly to provide to your board members, um, et cetera, for doing it yourself. It's typically just knowledge, um, time, expertise, um, et cetera. And in, in many cases, we'll go in and work with a team that's doing it themselves and we'll just sort of be an extension and help them and kind of mentor them through that. Um, the second part of your question was, I believe, um, other, the other BD companies, other, um, business development type companies like yourselves, like Maxis versus your competition. You know, so. Sure. So I, I can't speak to the services that others provide. Um, I can speak to kind of high level, uh, there are all sorts of different organizations out there. You've got your big commercial real estate companies who are amazing. We've got relationships with many of them. And they just simply the volume of site selection projects that they're doing um, prevents their incentives team sometimes from being able to cover every one of them for incentives. So a lot of times we'll come in and partner with them. Um, so they've got their strengths. Um, usually they're looking at the fortune 500, Fortune 100 clients. Um, and then you've got more the middle market, um, which we feel like is a very underserved market. And I'd say that that's where Maxis's sweet spot is. We come in and work with the businesses who know just enough to be dangerous, but don't really realize when they're having conversations with the mayor because they play golf, that that could actually work against them because they don't have anybody to level the playing field and they don't have a buffer. Wow. Gotcha. During those negotiations, if that sure. makes sense. You know, it does. It does. Actually, um, something you said kind of reminded me of uh, quiz machinery in terms of like, the way you said that there's there's people who handle components of it. There's companies like the, the commercial real estate agents that handle a component, but they're not looking at the whole picture. When quiz machinery, there are people who we work 
against sometimes and for and with sometimes um, who are there. Like I use the analogy of the hammer, right? Um, to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? And they say, okay, well, we can solve this through our our means, but that, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a nail. Maybe it requires a screw in this case. And so the um, so being able to take that step back and have the bigger picture. And that's part of the role you guys provide for quiz machinery is that a lot of times, you know, companies like mine will just get focused on the machinery and don't think, Hey, before we can get to that, we, we need to answer this over here. We need to get some of this stuff. These, these other issues you've got facing, you know, help you grow from there. And then we can leverage that growth into the machinery side. So we, um, so that's where you guys kind of, uh, play a role for what we do so that's great so um sure the um you mentioned uh you know you mentioned labor uh, we'll talk about that in a second but i was thinking about um a lot every company everybody i've had on this on this interview and uh, the companies i work with everybody kind of pays attention to certain things like for example i work a lot in the um in the furniture world and those guys really pay attention to new housing starts that's a number that they love to pay attention to because they know it's going to impact the health of their industry and their sales. And if people are buying new, if you're building new houses then they're going to need furniture to fill them. And, um, and so that's kind of one of the metrics they pay attention to other metrics that Max has pays attention to, to say, Hey, this industry over here is showing these markers. We need to go focus some of our energy over there or are there other industries that say, um, maybe you look at like demographics of people are moving to this area. Maybe we need to start looking for sites in that arena. Like what kind of numbers that are out there does, does Maxis pay attention to? So I would say, you know, from an industry standpoint, you know, when, when COVID was in, in full force and, you know, I know that things are changing and, and people are being immunized and the world sort of at least in the United States, things seem to be getting back to some semblance of normal. We were just kind of looking at and seeing a lot of growth in food manufacturing, obviously in the medical arena, tons of that packaging, e-commerce is exploding. Um, there, we're seeing migrations to the Southeast, um, to the Midwest, from the West Coast, from the Northeast, um, we're, we're really seeing just so many different um, things happening. And, and from a, a building availability or site availability for existing buildings, that continues to be a challenge. So there's a lot of speculative building going up. And we work to build relationships with developers to, to try to help them help their, their future clients. But you know, in some scenarios, we were working on a project in North Carolina very recently with one of our large manufacturers and ah, a building went up and there were, I want to say, 10 offers within 24 hours. Wow. Um, so, and it, you know, you're going to have different, <clears throat> excuse me, regions uh, across the country where you're going to have more availability and less availability, but it's kind of, um, we're seeing in some areas, there's not enough supply, just like in the housing market. Sure. Oh yeah. It's a big, and, big issue in our world too. It's, um, there's lots of, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, the last year of the pandemic has really um, just changed so much of the perception, the way we interpret data, the way we look at it, the way we, what value we put on certain key points and, and um, in terms of supply chain, in terms of, um, you know, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I've always loved it. I, I studied economics in college and it's always been my macroeconomics has always been kind of my little hobby and, and passion. And, and, but really because I love the ripple effect of things. I love knowing how this over here impacts that over there and, and understanding that and getting to see kind of behind the curtain of things. And um, it's it's really we're getting to see a lot of that right now on a very um, up close, you know, real real life kind of uh, studies, if you will, um, case studies kind of viewpoint. So it's uh, it's good. So uh, you mentioned earlier the labor gap being a big issue, and I know you've had a lot of roles over the years in different um, 
you know, not just with Maxis, but other exposure to manufacturers that um, and that labor gap being a problem. Um, but maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the successes that you've seen, some of the companies that you've seen through this experience or previous experiences where maybe you see uh, a company that, that doesn't have a labor problem, you know, just has plenty of people who love working for them and, and give that extra bit. Um, would you feel comfortable talking about that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, I wouldn't call myself a total expert, <laughs> but but I can tell you that what I've seen in industry throughout my life, you know, in my, in my prior world, I worked with ADP. Um, and so I worked with companies all over the country and worked with them on incentives. And the successful companies uh, that we worked with that didn't really seem to have much of a labor problem were those that had a very solid corporate culture. Um, and they had uh, an approach with their employees where there was a clear chain of communication and the benefits were there. And they had um, all sorts of programs to acknowledge their employees. And the pay, of course, is always important, but if the culture isn't there, you can have an exodus if a new manufacturer opens up two miles down the road and they're paying 50 cents more. Sure. There are just so many different factors that come into play with keeping employees happy. And I would say the number one issue that I saw, or I guess the number one or one of the most important things is ensuring that your employees feel valued, sure. in not just their wages, but um, the culture at large and, and how they are treated. Are they listened to? Um, are there opportunities for growth? But I would say that's the number one um, in addition to wages. And, and, you know, a lot of it depends on the type of employee, you know, what is their role? Um, sure. Sure. That's good. That's a really good point. I, uh, that, that's been a big problem in, uh, in a couple of our areas of industries we work with right now is that um, one of them said, and I did a quote just three weeks ago, he said, I feel like it's the wild west out here in terms of labor. And I said, mm -hmm. what do you mean? He said, I feel like we're all just trading people around right now. And, and, and it's, we all need the labor so bad that we're overpaying versus what it's worth to us because we need people. You know, it's, it, it seems like it's worth that to us because we need it that bad. But the truth is that the labor, what we're paying those people may not match what the revenue that they're generating. It's just that sure. not having somebody there is creating such a hole that um, we'd rather have somebody there than not. And hopefully we can compensate for that in other areas. And, and I was like, wow, that's uh, it's pretty insightful. But um, yeah, the, um, so do you feel like, uh, in terms of the, um, and I and I appreciate you sharing the ADP thing. I didn't actually realize that was your background. That's uh, that's got to give you some really good perspective when you're helping your customers with access too. Um, just having seen all those different sides of the industry and all it does. Stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. Um, so the <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about Shelly. Let's talk specifically about you. So. Um, <laughs> What profession other than your own would you like to attend? Oh, boy. You know, I'm one of those personalities that just, I like too many things. Um, I, I'm a dreamer. I, I always get these big ideas of, of things that I want to do. And I, But I'd say at the core is, I don't know, it's, I just like people and, and I get a, a really huge boost off of helping people. So there are so many things I'd like to do, but one of the things I love, love, love is music. Love music, um, love children, um, any, any, I guess, sect of the society that, that might have a need or help. I love children and elderly people and disabled people. If they need me, I'm, that makes me happy to help them. So one of the things I would love to do, and I, I hope to do this when I retire, is to start a, a children's choir um, for underprivileged kids that would otherwise have a uh, music opportunity. Um, I sing in a choir. I recently acquired a ukulele. I'm learning to play that, uh, beginner level. 
um, and play piano as well and would love to be able to combine those to bring some joy into the lives of, of kids that just, you know, they, they could use a boost in their lives. That's awesome. That's awesome. Music is, uh, I think if any, if, you know, that's one thing I was talking with a buddy the other day about the past year and, and some of the things that come out of it. And I think artists have really stepped up their game in the last year and uh, in terms of everything from um, the types of messages they're bringing out to the ways they're bringing out those messages. And, and maybe it's just the fact that I've been able to take a step back from my life and see the work that they've actually, they're actually doing. But, um, but music is really, um, I thought this was kill music, but they've reinvented themselves and, you know, the lack of live concerts and the lack of yeah. the audience to perform to, but they really, um, it's been amazing. Uh, I really have, um, yeah, music is great. It's great. Well, hopefully, um, I, uh, that'd be great. I'd like to hear you sing sometime. <laughs> I um, won't do it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. That'll be a different podcast that we do. So, so Shelly, this is a funny question, but what historical figure do you either most identify with or, um, admire? There are a lot of and just, I don't even know how to answer that question because there are just too many that I have so much respect for, um, you know, but something not necessarily historical figure, but just kind of comes to mind with just who I identify with, or if I could pick someone, <laughs> you're going to laugh, but it would be the star of aliens, the movie, um, uh, Ripley, uh, Sigourney Weaver's character. She was just a bad ass. Yeah. You know, she she got these monsters, these aliens coming after her and her team's flipping out and she just managed to keep going. And that's the part about her that I think I identify with. There are some really scary times, you know, in life. And, you know, there've been some times in business when I've thought, oh, you know, how's this meeting going to go? And can I really address this board the way that, you know, they need to hear this story and you just have to keep going and persevere. Granted, mm -hmm. a, a board is nothing like those horrific aliens, but uh, I would like to be that level of badass eventually in my life. Just channel your inner Ripley, huh? That's good. That's I like, right. <laughs> I like that. That's a good one. I, I, that should be a good, that'd be a good tattoo. Um, find your inner Ripley. It'd be good. The, uh, no, that's, um, yeah, I, I really respect a lot of those. It's one of the things that if I look back on the characters and people, historical figures, even, you know, fictional characters that I really respect, it's people who, who are just cool under pressure. You know, it's just, that's just, yeah, this, this isn't what I asked for. This is what got handed to me. And this is what I'm going to do with it. You know, and this is, how I'm going to, I'm going to make it, I'm going to be cool. And um, yeah, I love that. It's, um, it's a sign of a good leader that they're ready that, yeah, this wasn't the situation we planned for, you know, even think about the pandemic, you know, yeah. we were expecting an amazing 2020. And, um, and then there was this moment in mid March where I was like, Hey, that has changed. We need to, what are we going to do? How, how can we, you know, we sat down as a company and we said, how can we come out of this stronger? Let's imagine this is going to last until the end of the year, which that, that was, an exact, we thought that was an exaggeration. Right. And, um, and we said, how do we come out of this in 2021 stronger than the way we went into 2020? And um, that's, uh, that's, that's Ripley. You know, she, uh, she did that. That's great. That's Getting great. through it until the very end. You know, a, there is a historical figure, though. I, when I was in college, I got my degree in PR and communications, and I had to take a public, several public speaking classes. And I had to do a speech on a, a hero or heroine. And this just came to mind. I hope it's okay that I, I mentioned this. Yeah. Um, but the one that I picked was Oscar Schindler. And if you're not familiar with Oscar Schindler, um, he was, uh, the, the movie Schindler's List was about Oscar Schindler. Okay. He was in Nazi Germany and he saved thousands and thousands of, of Jewish lives um, in his manufacturing facility. Um, they made bullets, if I recall correctly, and children. And um, that's another one that I feel like, I mean, I'm just getting chills even thinking about it. I had to do a lot, a lot of research, but just the level of bravery and care for other human beings. Sure. 
um, was is just so, so powerful to me. And I think if we can translate that into our daily lives and, and you know, just I, I feel even silly almost making that comparison because the, the, the stakes were so high there. But if we just care about each other, every person we interact with, even in business, um, you know, the, that to me is the stuff of life. Sure. And I think it has to translate to our business lives too. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, you can try and separate them all you want, but at the end of the day, you know, the person you are in one is going to be the person you are in the other. And it's going to be, um, and the, the, the impact you have in one is going to be similar to the impact you have in the other. So it's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's good. That's a really good one. Um, so, uh, uh, you have a lot of talents. I know this. Uh, what talent would you most like to have? I think that I would like, um, uh, what do you call those people that, that remember everything they read? Oh, yeah. Um, what, not photographic that? memory, but there's a... Phot- Photographic memory. I would love to have a photographic memory. That would be powerful. Information. (laughs) And there's so much legislation that comes out on incentives and um, all sorts of of things that are impactful to my clients. I wish I could remember everything I read. That's a good one. That's really good talent. That would be great. Um, So what fuels Shelly creatively? Hmm. A lot of things. Music fuels me creatively. Um, gardening is huge. Love, love, love to work in the garden. I walked up our driveway, I don't know, about three weeks ago and I walked up the driveway and I saw this area and I just envisioned this rock path and I had to make it. And so I, I basically called dirt my, my Play-Doh. That's awesome. That's really good. Love landscaping. Yeah, my wife and I bought a house at 70 years old. And um, I, I was, I've learned a lot about myself in the process of that. And um, it's been, um, but yeah, the, it's fun when we've actually had some stuff happen recently that she was, she was like, hey, I really want to put this porch swing together. <laughs> and me having the woodworking background, I initially thought she was just going to say, hey, will you build a support swing? She was like, oh, I want to do this as a couple. She found the plans. She bought the wood. She did all I, you know, I, I helped. And uh, it was so much fun as a couple to do that together. And I love sitting on that swing. And just not just because it's great to have a porch swing. It's, um, but also just because just thinking about us doing it together. It was a lot of fun. And it's, uh, it definitely, and now, now I'm getting addicted. Now I'm looking around my house going, oh, what else can we do together? You know, it's a lot of fun. The creativity comes out. It's fun. It's just, so, you, you made a history with it. It's, we, it's we did. you built it. Yeah. It it's a story. You, know? it's you bought. Great. Yeah. There's a story. Yeah. That's great. So if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, Shelly, you made it by the hair of your chinny chin chin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I would like to, to hear God, um, say good job on what you've done for others. Good job on your service. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get there. I try, um, you know, but I, I try every day, but I think that's what I would really love to hear the most. Uh, knowing you and, and I, I, I know you're trying, I know you're doing great and I, uh, that's, uh, I'm, you are doing a great job. And I know your clients, even the ones that I've sent to you and sent you to um, talk about how much you're helping them. So thank you for that. And uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a joy. It's a joy. Yep. It's a wonderful thing when your passion for helping others and your, your passion for, you know, for businesses and, and seeing that growth, it, it gets you paid, you know, is it is also your job. It's a wonderful alignment of, of uh, career and, and, uh, and passion at the same time. So I'm glad you have that and uh, it's showing in what you do. So 
Okay. So, uh, so thank you for your time today. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out and, uh, and talk with me and uh, look forward Absolutely. to on future projects. And uh, thanks again for your help with our clients. And, um, and thanks. You're welcome. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. You too, Sean. Bye. Bye-bye.